So let me just get us to the right spot and Kellyanne will take it away. Sounds great. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me today. I apologize. I've only got a little bit of battery on my computer. It's acting very strange. So that's why we sort of swapped things around. I'll, I'll buzz through quickly and then, uh, and then hopefully I'll be able to call in for the rest of the webinar if anybody has any questions. But in the meantime, um, I'll sort of buzz through and tell you a little bit more about what I do. Uh, so my company is Green Door Labs and I'm an indie game designer. I've been game, designing games for museums and cultural institutions for about 10 years now, which is crazy. Um, and I've done a bunch of projects with OnCell. Uh, my specialty is location-based games, uh, which now has the very fancy name of XR, or mixed reality. Uh, so you hear VR, virtual reality, AR, augmented reality, and then there's XR, which is mixed reality. And XR is when you have objects that are location-based, you know, something that's maybe in your, um, in your location. Uh, and then also there's a digital element. Uh, so digital and physical together. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us. I see folks from Naperville, Illinois, uh, Canadian Museum of Nature. I love that place. Um, Trail Works. So yeah, great, great to see you. Hi everyone. So you want to go forward and uh, I'll buzz through. So what's in a game? Um, Gooseberry Falls, Minnesota. All right. Oh, you're probably colder than we are here in New England. Uh, so. Games have really had um, a sort of a, a resurgence as a social uh, way to hang out over the last five, ten years. And you've probably seen a bunch of different types of games. They have board game nights, and now there are board game stores, and board games are really very popular. Uh, so what's in a game? I'm just going to buzz through a bunch of different types of games that I like to work on. Um, I highly recommend everybody play board games. Uh, the reason is because board games will give you a really good basics on game design, what works for games. Uh, you get to watch other people interact with games. You get to see what you dislike when you're playing a game, and all in real time and for very cheap. Uh, so I totally recommend Settlers of Catan is a really great one. Ticket to Ride, Seven Wonders, Power Grid, these are four of my favorites. And those will show you game dynamics without necessarily having to like either spend hours and hours learning how to play a video game um, or even uh, having to invest in a new type of game. Um, all right, so Monica, my battery is gonna die in just a second. I have my phone, so if you have some way to keep me in there with my phone, then that would be amazing, but I don't really know what to do, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, so analog location-based games, that's the type of game that I um, have been building for the last 10 years. And when I started 10 years ago, it was kind of a crazy, weird new thing. Uh, now it's a little bit more common, uh, thanks to things like Pokemon Go and escape rooms. And uh, in New England, we have something that we call Bodeborg, which is this really fantastic interactive location-based game. You should totally check it out if you have a second. Um, uh, but there's also sort of more traditional things like scavenger hunts. You also might know a little bit about geocaching or letterboxing. And you're also starting to see a lot of things happen in the world of immersive theater. Uh, interactive immersive theater, um, which are sort of these uh, event-based games, uh, something like Sleep No More um, or Then She Fell. These things uh, are, are all in New York right now. Uh, so if you want to buzz us to the next one. Uh, mixed reality location-based games, those ones are the ones that use the digital and the analog, and that's more like Pokemon Go. Um, Niantic Labs is the one that created Ingress. Uh, so Ingress and Pokemon Go, if you haven't played before, highly recommend it. Uh, just not necessarily because you want to play Pokemon Go for the rest of your life, but because it will let you see how these games work and how to interact with them. And there's a lot of museums that have built mixed reality location-based games that have been very successful. Uh, so Operation Spy, that's at the uh, International Spy Museum in DC. Uh, RevQuest uh, was sort of a, an original, a proto-location-based game that they're doing at uh, Williamsburg. If you go to Disneyland, you're gonna see all of this stuff happening at Disneyland. Uh, I always consider them sort of like the the golden gods of play, you know, like they're always on the cutting edge of what's happening with play and interaction and entertainment design. Um, and you'll find that they're doing a lot of stuff right now with mixed reality and immersive theater. So totally check that that one out as well. Uh, Murder at the Met um, is one of the first games that I built with the uh, with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Again, this is something where people are in a physical space, but they may have some sort of a digital device to sort of help them through it. Um, building paper games. At 
museums is great, but it's not always efficient, especially if you're going to be running it with, you know, lots and lots and lots of people. It's hard to fix games. It's hard to, uh, hard to fix paper games, hard to get the content and the data back from it, right? So when you do a digital version, you know exactly who's playing, you know what they're saying, you know where they're getting stuck and, you know, where they're moving on. Um, so next slide. So now, digital sprite-based games. When people talk about games, usually they're thinking about these sprite-based games, but it's very rare for a museum to successfully build a digital sprite-based game. Um, it, it's typical for a museum to build one, but it doesn't usually achieve the educational goals that you have. Uh, so when I say digital sprite-based game, usually that means there's like an image, and you're gonna move that image across the screen somehow. So this is like a 2D sprite-based game. Um, and so when you think of like Angry Birds, right, um, or Farmville or that type of thing, like mostly the action that I'm doing is tap, 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 tap. It's good, it's fun, it's addictive, but it doesn't usually achieve the educational goals that you want. They're also very expensive to build. Um, and so when I started building games, I was like, yeah, okay, you know, take a look at Toka Boca and these other sort of, you know, bigger labs that are that are building these sprite-based games, but they just weren't getting, certainly museums or cultural institutions, the things that they wanted out of their players. Um, and that's why I started building things that were a little bit more text-based, a little bit more analog and connected to the actual objects that were in the physical space. Um, yeah, what's next? Oh, can we go next? Oh, there we go. So I've started building more things that are digital story-based games. Uh, you'll find more story-based stuff in the educational scene. So when people are building educational games, you'll see them sort of lean towards uh, story. Now, the interesting thing about story-based games is who your audience is, right? So for instance, Leave Extraordinary Bloggers, that's something we built with the Boston Children's Museum, there was um, essentially a reading barrier there because it's a story-based game. We meant it to be for anywhere between eight and 12 years old, which worked perfectly because under eight years old, they're just not going to read and they're just not going to be interested in that kind of a story. Um, so if you're creating story-based games, then you definitely want to think about who that audience is, what their reading level is, and also how long it takes them to read this uh, object. Like, where are they when they're reading, right? Are they, are they sitting down? Like, Quandary is a really great story-based sort of text choose-your-own-adventure game that you can play on a computer, but it's going to be much harder to create and play something like that if you are standing in the middle of a museum or historical space, right? Because we always say that every game is only as good as the um, capacity of the youngest kid, right? So whenever, whenever the youngest person in that group has to go to the bathroom, your game is over. So we always consider that as, you know, uh, where, where people are going to be. Uh, so that gets us into, I believe, game goals. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you, Kellyan. Um, oh, this is crazy. My, um, my screen just went entirely dead. We can see and hear you, but I have a feeling it's because we're about to lose you. So I'm thinking that what we can do here is um, if Kellyan is not able to call into the webinar and join by phone, I might be able to just call her directly and um, see if you guys can hear her on speaker. She won't necessarily be able to see where we're at on the screen, but um, so sorry for the technical issues here. Um, Kelly and joined us remotely and um, unexpectedly that is and didn't have her computer's charger. So we're kind of improvising and doing our best here. Let me get Kelly in on the line and tell her where we're at and maybe we can proceed that way. Thanks so much for your patience, everyone. Hi, Hi. Kellyan. I am going to place you on speaker. Okay. So we are currently on the goal, uh, goal slide. So oh, um, let me know, everyone, if you guys can hear Kellyan all right. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you? I, I, I'll keep chatting. Yes, all right. Yes, yes. Okay? Oh, 
that they said you're a little glad. quiet, but you guys are good <laughs> coming up with clever solutions. Um, so when you build a game, one of the most important things um, is what do you want out of that game? Uh, especially for nonprofits and museums, you have such a limited budget. Your resources are very limited. Your time is very limited. And so when you create something, you want to make sure that it does what you want it to do. Uh, and so you got to figure out what that is right at the very beginning. So a good a, a good goal for a game is something that you can count, something that you can prove. Um, so when you have to go back to your team afterwards and say this game was a success, you can say, oh, it's a success because we wanted to A, B, and C, and we got it. Um, so a good goal is granular, something like um, we would like um, you know, 100 families to interact with this game. Uh, we would like to get 200 Twitter posts in this game. Uh, we would like to be able to prove that students previously um, thought that Asia was a country, now they know that Asia is many different countries, right? They're good learning goals that you can do for stuff like that. Uh, things that I get nervous about when people talk about game goals, not nervous, it's just a starting spot. When people say, oh, well, what do you want for your game? Oh, well, we want people to have fun. Um, well, that's great. You know, of course you want people to have fun, but you know, if you want a bunch of kids to have fun, then, you know, plop a hat on them and send them out to the playground so that they can have fun. Because that's the most fun thing for a five-year-old. You know, if you want them to have fun in the museum, that's a little bit different. You might have some other things that you want them to do as well. Um, if they say things like, let's engage the 18 to 34 demographic. Um, that can be a goal, but you definitely want it to be a little bit more granular than that, right? Now, how do you how do you engage the 18 to 34 demographic? Well, you put them all in a bar, right? If that's all you want to do, then that's, that's probably the easiest way to go about it. So you might want to be a little bit more specific, like we would like the 18 to 34 demographic to come to the museum on such and such a night and make it a social space where they talk about it and they take selfies and they meet people and they look at the art and they consider this a community place you know that's something that you can something that you can achieve so as you guys are, are sitting here and you know sort of thinking about games and game goals I would love for you guys to sort of scribble down a couple of goals that your institution might have about uh, about building a game why build a game you know like what is your goal with a game what are you looking to achieve and uh, and I'll give you a couple of goals um, that have been from games that I have built. Um, so I recently built a game with the Peabody Essex Museum for their Playtime exhibit. Uh, the Playtime exhibit was actually very intense. Um, and so their purpose was to give people a rest. They wanted people to have a two minute calm, chill rest right in the middle of the gallery and then they could move on. Something light to give them a break from the content. That's a very achievable goal, right? Because we could see how long people were spending there. We could see the looks on their faces. Did they sit down for two minutes and smile? Yes, they did. Um, you know, it, another goal for that game was we wanted something to uh, cross generations, right? So something where we can have uh, kids and grown-ups both sit down at the same kiosk and interact. And that's something that we could prove, you know, like did kids play the game with their families at the kiosk, yes. You know, so we can say that that was, uh, that, that was a success. It did what we wanted it to do. Uh, another game that I recently ran was with the Harvard Semitic Museum. And we wanted to create something that would engage freshmen and get them into the museum. So this was an event-based game. And Harvard kids, you may or may not know, are historically finick, uh, finicky, extremely difficult to please. Um, so we needed something that was difficult and interesting and cool enough that was going to get them into a museum of ancient cultures, which is uh, one of the less popular museums in the Harvard Museum Group. Um, yeah, so we uh, we sold out right away. We had probably about 150 kids that came and played in the escape room at the museum. And uh, they uh, did it again. So it was successful enough that we were able to um, run it uh, a couple of months later and we got the, the same kind of response. And kids left um, with posters. They, got, they, they found that there were sort of like these extra advertising posters from museum. They were so psyched about it that they took posters and they took selfies with their posters and they put them on social media. So, you know, also very achievable. Right, you know, we, we were able to get 150 freshmen into the museum and talking about it. Great. Yeah, yeah. So, um, have we gotten any any uh, suggested goals that these uh, museums might have? And I can't see the chat, yes. but uh, but Allison, you can. 
Yeah. So, um, folks, if you had a chance to, you know, take part in that exercise and, um, jot down some of your goals, share them with us in the chat. If you'd like to, um, we're here to kind of, you know, bounce around some ideas and, and help you guys come up with a direction. So please share those with us. If you have any ideas, um, if you have any goals that you want to explore, um, I haven't seen anything come in yet, but it looks like we've got some folks typing. So, okay, um, great. yeah, it looks we'll like keep going and then we'll chat about that a little bit later. Yeah. 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 Good Good idea. <laughs> and on game goals. Great. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about resources. Um, so when I whenever I build a game, the first thing that I do is I sit down with all the stakeholders holders, and I decide the parameters. Um, so the design parameters are essentially what I can build with what I have, um, which is a little very different than uh, how a lot of other game designers build. But I think that's because I build with museums. You know, I build in nonprofits, and so. So what's the perfect game? It is the one that we are able to complete and achieve and get out the door for you guys um, within your budget and on time uh, without too much stress or trouble for anybody. Uh, and if you're going to achieve that, then you really need to sit down and think about your parameters first. Um, a lot of the trouble that people get into is they'll sit down and say like, oh, well, I want it to be like Pokemon Go, but, you know, but be for art, which is a great idea. But you probably want to think about what you have first, you know. Um, so goals, what do you want? Resources, what do you have that you can use? And then restrictions, you know, what can you not use? Uh, so you, if you find that, you know, actually, um, you know, our resources are you know, $20 and a roll of duct tape and our goals are to get people inside the museum, um, then maybe Pokemon Go location-based game is not, you know, maybe not the best type of game for you to build. You know, they're expensive and mostly internal. Uh, so, yeah, so let's think about resources because you can build a game with anything. Anything you have, you can absolutely build a game with. If you've got a couple of pieces of paper, um, if you've got a, a bunch of random crafts in a box, um, even if you're just making things up, um, sitting around a, a dining room table, you know, anything can be games, anything can be fun. Uh, so, one of the one of the easiest resources, though, that museums will often have is um, manpower, right? Because depending on what your uh, collection is, sometimes you'll just have a lot of people who care a lot about what you're doing. So maybe you'll end up with a couple of interns, and maybe maybe those interns are really good writers, or maybe those interns are really good graphic designers. Um, or maybe those interns have some sort of an existing community. You know, an existing community is an incredible resource when you're trying to build a game. Uh, can you build a game just for swing dancers? Can you build a game just for people who care an awful lot about architecture? Um, can you build a game that's specifically for um, uh, stay-at-home moms and, and young children? Can you build something that's for homeschoolers? Uh, if you have an existing community, then that is a really good place to start from. And, uh, and I usually say that if you try and build a game that's for everybody, then it's much harder to get it off the ground. So start with that first core community and then kind of work out from there because they'll come and then they'll tell everybody about it. It's your, your first line of fire for your players. Um, something else that's kind of handy is maybe you have something that's special in your collection, uh, something that people care an awful lot about or something that's you know famous in its own way. Um, I know the, the new New Bedford Whaling Museum has this famous whale that drips oil. I've never seen it, but I would love to. And it, were I to do anything with the New Bedford Whaling Museum, I would say, like, okay, we, we got to do something with this whale because everybody talks about it, and it's something that would sort of be an easy hook to get people excited. Um, for instance, when we were working with the um, uh, Harvard Semitic Museum, we called it Escape the Curse of Heta Ferris um, because we had the chair of Heta Ferris, an, an ancient Egyptian queen. Um, and we also happened to have the resource of an assistant curator who was just really into it and totally wanted to play a part and be theatrical. And it was hilarious having him there. You know, he played a part and ran the opening and closing of this of this game. Um, yeah, so just a really, really fun resource that we already had. Easier to use your existing resources than it is to go out and try and chase down resources that you don't have. Um, another thing that's kind of handy 
is sometimes you'll just get a very strange donation of stuff, right? Or sometimes you'll just happen to have a, a campus of strange things. You know, you'll you'll have uh, maybe a donor will say, you know, oh, I wanted to give you all of my mother's clothes, you know, from the 1930s. Here they are, huge donation. Uh, you don't know what you're going to do with it, but you might be able to make a game, something like that. Um, when I was working with Ansel for the Squirrely University game, which is just so much fun, um, Stratford Hall, the, the Lee family homestead in Virginia, they just had a lot of squirrels. And so when I sat down to try and figure out, like, okay, what do we have for stories? What do we have for resources that will get people excited? And oddly enough, squirrels was really a pretty good answer to that. They had a ton of squirrels on their campus. They were running around. Kids loved looking at all the squirrels everywhere. And uh, and the Lee family themselves um, had a squirrel in their, in their regular coat of arms. And uh, it turns out there's a lot of information about squirrels in uh, colonial America. So, yeah, so uh, an odd resource, but one that was really pretty helpful. Um, so, Allison, what do you think? Have we gotten any uh, any submissions? Yeah, or? yeah. We had um, a bunch of people tell us. Now, I hope I'm going to pronounce this correctly. Is it Kirsten? Um, she said that um, they're looking to draw 22 to 30-year-olds to their historic site. Mm -hmm. And oh, let me just get back here because it uh, scrolled up and I lost her, her comment. Um, yeah, looking to draw 22 to 30 year olds to their historic site um, and generate posts on social media using a hashtag. Oh, great. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's really doable. You know, 22 to 30 year olds um, and generate posts on social media. So those are two different games, or, or two, uh, two different goals, essentially. So drawing 22 to 30 year olds, um, an escape room is, you know, really a low hanging fruit way to do that. Um, I know a bunch of museums that are starting to build out escape rooms, either as events um, or as uh, more consistent installations um, or if you want them to generate posts on social media you can always do some sort of a social media challenge right you know uh, museum selfie um, people love things like a, like uh, Smithsonian did a, a what is this challenge where they would post an object on Instagram and they would say like what do you think this is and it was uh, an extreme close-up of something people might know um, or it might even be like some strange thing that people couldn't identify, you know, things like, uh, there's all sorts of fun historical objects like that, right? Like bed, uh, the bed warmers that have the big long hooks or, you know, or button hooks and things that people, like they might be appealing, but they're not quite sure what they are. Like that's kind of a fun way to do it. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, Danielle said that they would like to have their visitors interact with artworks without touching mm -hmm. them. Ooh, that's great. There, so actually, there's a thing that's been, it, it sort of pops up, and then it goes back, and then it pops up. But people do seem to love to do that art doppelganger. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> right? You know, like where you, you have to find a piece of art that looks the most like you, or you have to find your art BFF, right? Like, right. who in this room, you know, what 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 room would you, uh, what painting uh, would you be the most likely to take home, you know, which find one a personal would, connection with the art, right? Yeah, yeah. Find a personal connection with the art. Uh, we did uh, something with the Detroit Institute of Art that was so much fun. Uh, we created uh, fortune tellers, art fortune tellers. Um, and they, it was just paper, you know, those little fortune tellers that you have yeah. as a kid, right? They're like those little foldy things. And, you know, so, and, and you would usually do them to figure out which boy liked you, right? That was the, that was <laughs> right, the fortune right, right. telling. <laughs> but we did it with art. And so we said, you know, find a piece of art, go up to it, um, and uh, spell the first color you see. So it'd be like B-L-A-C-K. Um, and then, okay, um, now write down what is the, uh, the largest number of objects you see here you know, and, and how many are there and you say oh well i i see like five boats in this one you know one two three four five and we would just kind of keep going on with those very direct questions where they had to answer with a number or a word and then afterwards um they would get their art fortune and their art fortune would say something like um this painting reminds you of somebody or something in this painting um, will foretell a future job of yours, uh, and uh, this was so fun because you know they were very they were very vague, like yeah. a good fortune is. Uh, and I had a woman come up to me afterwards as I was testing this in Detroit. She said to me, uh, "So are these fortunes true?" 
and you want to be very, very thoughtful, right? I'm yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> they might be true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because she, it really impacted her. Um, and she said, uh, you know, because I was standing in front of a picture of um, – Christ on the cross, and my fortune said that it would be related to my future job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, what do you think that is? It's open for interpretation. Um, Danielle also added that they're thinking about creating something for their outdoor sculpture garden Excuse exhibition. Me, just a second. Yeah, of just course, no problem. Um, so I think what we're going to do also, since we've only got a few minutes left um, before we hit our 30 minutes, um, all right. Kelly, and you all good? Uh, yes, yes, All right. We have a few, um, a few more ideas that were, that were tossed around that I would love to just kind of chat about. Um, first, just to make sure that we, um, you know, hit all of our slides in our allotted time, I'm going to run through some of the on sale projects that we've done um, in collaboration with Kelly and Green Door Labs. Um, some of them you may have seen, you know, about in our, you know, social media and previous webinars. So some of them might be familiar, and hopefully you guys have had a chance to download them and check them out already. But um, yeah, we'll just run through some pretty high level stuff too. Um, if you guys are thinking about doing games, this probably has already been on your mind. Like what's the benefit of a game for your site? Um, so it's just another way to engage and interact and educate people about the stories that you're going to be sharing. Um, you get active participation, really getting them, you know, interacting with the space, um, Danielle, yes, we will be posting this um, so you can watch a replay on our YouTube channel. I believe if you registered, you'll also get an email to watch the replay directly from um, Livestorm. So it will definitely be available later. So um, some other benefits, too, you can um, associate your museum with fun, right? Drawing people in, teaching them that history is fun and engaging and, and art is cool and, and it's not just a stuffy place to come look at paintings, right? You actually get to have fun there um, and playing, you know, what's more fun than playing a game? Um, it adds a social dimension for families and groups, so getting them working together, collaborating, you know, interpreting the space and kind of accomplishing something together. Um, you get to uh, encourage observation, critical thinking, and problem solving. Um, really good way to address some of the different, you know, stories and information um, and histories that our clients are looking to share. Um, so Kelly touched a little bit on location-based games. Um, one that uh, one that she did um, on our platform was the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which was a murder at the Met. It's a really fun kind of murder mystery whodunit kind of game where you get to explore the American wing, solve a murder mystery. Um, this was an award-winning app when it was out. Um, and uh, it did include some custom development where um, our developers actually created a, a notepad feature within the game that players could use to save their clues uh, as they played. And then one of these more task-based games um, that Kellyan mentioned already was the um, Stratford Hall app, which is the birthplace of Robert E. Lee, and, and she did a squirrely university there. It's super fun. It's kind of like you complete a research project um, for children age 6 through 12. Um, and so it, it really encourages critical thinking, asks some questions, um, encourages them to make observations, and then kind of take note as they complete these challenges in their research project. Um, really fun, really educational, and just really unique. Um, and then kind of a choose-your-own-adventure style game would be um, one where you can kind of almost select a character or a narrator to take you through. And a lot of people are, you know, aware with a choose-your-own-adventure style um, experience, especially now, right, Netflix, <laughs> for all you Netflix bingers, um, you know, has a, a new choose-your-own-adventure style. Yeah, uh, Black Mirror. So um, we did it first. <laughs> so, you know, this is fun where you can kind of, yeah, change the story or the adventure, you know, letting the, the end user choose the path that they want to go down in the app, and the story will change depending on that. So it's still kind of a fun, interactive way to give the end user control over the experience. Um, so this one was um, an app that we did with the uh, Old State House um, in Boston. 
And then a scavenger style um, game is, uh, would be like the one we did for the city of independence in Missouri. Um, so the pioneers to presidents game, uh, we built um, super fun concept. So their goal um, was to get people to visit the city's run historic sites. And, and there's so many historic sites with such cool stories to tell. And they're like, how do we get people there? So um, the premise of the game is that you're going to go on an Oregon Trail adventure, which is something you would totally do if you were in Independence, Missouri. Um, but in order to go on your adventure, you need to earn supplies. So you can collect those supplies, kind of like scavenger hunt style, by going to the different historic sites and completing on-site challenge. So this is definitely that mix of an analog experience with a digital tie-in. Um, and the challenges are everything from correcting historical anomalies, like answering a question about um, some history you would learn at this site um, to photo challenges where you know we might say the, our records indicate the statue of um, you know Harry Truman looks like this but that doesn't seem right you know take a photo with the statue and, and help us correct that history so um, as the players go through all the historic sites and complete the challenges they'll earn badges representing the different supplies needed on the trail and then once they have, you know, if you're in Independence, once you've earned all of the badges, you can actually take it to the uh, Visitor Experience Center and earn um, an, an, an actual physical prize to represent your accomplishment. So it's really fun, really interactive, and it's nice that there's kind of an incentive at the end, too, to kind of uh, reward you for your, for your journey. And then um, kind of a trivia style game uh, would be like the Mount Rushmore Junior Ranger Quest app. Um, and this is a, a, you know, a companion to their Junior Ranger program where, um, you know, it's, it's geared towards kids, um, a wider age range than some of the physical Junior Ranger um, paper-based games that they have on site. Um, but the nice thing about this is that you can download it and you can play the game. It's written so that you can do it on site or off site. So if your family is planning a trip to Mount Rushmore, kind of helps build anticipation and kind of set the stage for what they might learn there. Um, they can actually complete the, the challenges, earn the badges off site. And then when they visit, they can actually um, redeem, you know, their, their digital game badges for their actual Junior Ranger badge. Um, so it really just kind of teaches them about, you know, some of the history of Mount Rushmore and um, tests their knowledge on that. So they can earn badges by uh, correctly answering questions about, uh, about Mount Rushmore. And um, so, yeah, those are some of the games that we have done. Um, we'll send out some links, you know, to where you can download the um, Find Your Independence app for the Presidents or the Pioneers to Presidents game as well as the Mount Rushmore Junior Ranger Quest. You can check those out. Um, we mentioned those in our webinar about new features because they both leverage things like um, badges, for instance, as a way to kind of offer rewards or incentives in a game experience. Um, a new feature that we have coming out soon, um, feel free to contact us about, is going to be like a photo filter, so that camera integration um, that the City of Independence utilized. Um, we'll be deploying that for new projects as well. So a lot, a lot of cool things you can do with the platform. Um, we are out of time, but I think we could probably take a couple minutes of questions if you guys want to pop them in the chat. Kellyanne, are you still with us? I'm still with you. Great. Um, I can pull up another couple of um, ideas. Uh, so we, uh, we must have some park and garden folks here um, because some people asked about, well, or mentioned that their goals would be to um, explore some of the garden, uh, teach plant identification. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. That's really fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, like garden exploration, interesting, right? Because you, uh, you want people going through the gardens, but you know, you also don't necessarily want people touching anything or, you know, you don't want too much traffic. Um, so a couple things that you could do with that. Um, one, like if you have some sort of a um, letterboxing, if you've ever heard of that before, um, is where you uh, sort of have a clue from uh, one location to another and you sort of leave parts of uh, a story that, that sort of moves along uh, a physical pathway. Um, you know, so something happens in this letter and then you, you know, give a clue to where you can find the next piece. That's cool. Um, okay, uh, actually, uh, Allison, could you answer the next question in just a second? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I did have a question from, Emily, um, from Ebony in here uh, about um, 
the on-sell features and capabilities. So um, some of those features, like badges, for instance, are available to all of our on-sell plans. So whether you have an audio guide or whether you have a light or a pro app, you can incorporate badges to offer incentives or create, you know, some uh, even a basic uh, interactive experience or kind of like a, a simple game using the badges. Um, things like the photo filters, since those are still in development, um, we'll be able to give more information about, you know, cost and, and plans and features once that's um, close to being ready for deployment. So um, hopefully that answers your question, but really creating a game on the on-sell platform, depending on what, what you're looking to do, you'll use a variety of on-sell features or tools to accomplish that. Um, so if you, have, if you have a pro web or native app, you're going to be able to do more because you'll have more tools at your disposal. You know, even things like the image map widget um, is a fun and interactive way to, um, you know, gamify your app by creating, you know, maybe you could have like a, a map, a graphic map of, you know, a treasure map, for instance, like that's something we've done when we've done an, a little internal game uh, for a, a company event, you know, where it was a treasure hunt game and we uploaded a treasure map and in the image map tool and created touchable hotspots on it that told you where to go um, to find the treasure. So um, yeah, the, the more tools you have, the more flexibility and creativity you have in creating your app. Um, but we can always work with you, you know, if you're only on light and that's what your budget allows, um, we can talk about how those tools can help you create um, a unique experience versus having all of the pro um, features at your disposal. And then, um, you know, if there's something that our platform doesn't do right now that you think you want it to do, talk to us. Um, it will be subject to custom development, but we've taken on those projects to build out special features such as that notepad. So unfortunately, that's not an outside the box or that's not a, a, an off the shelf feature that's ready for everyone to use right now, but it is something that we custom built for the Murder at the Met app. Um, so depending on what you're looking to do, we can, you know, work with you to see if our platform can achieve it and talk about, you know, price. Um, yeah, and I found that the, the on-sale platform is one of my favorite platforms to build because it's just really flexible. Um, and I build with whatever platforms I can find with whatever platforms we need at the time. Um, but yeah, so you want, you want something that's just going to give you a lot of options. That helps a lot. Yeah, cool. Uh, Matthew said that he likes the choose your own adventure idea on letterboxing. They have decades of expeditions into China and the Ozarks. And yeah, it would be yeah. fun to recreate one of those trips. Um, oh, yeah. That would be so fun. I did a project one time with the um, Adirondacks Museum. And we did like a visual, a, a, a physical version of Ticket to Ride, which was kind of fun. I don't know if you've ever played Ticket to Ride yeah. before. Um, where, you know, like, so you have to pick up the expedition and you say like, okay, I'm going to go from such and such a location to such and such a location. You choose which of the quests you want to go on um, and then you have to answer a bunch of questions in order to complete that quest and if you get it then you have to choose another quest and so it's you know how many how many expeditions can you complete over the course of an hour um, that was kind of a fun a fun game we played it with a bunch of fourth graders and they loved it cool yeah Kelly and we have um, a ticket to ride master in our midst here <laughs> Kirsten <laughs> Kirsten uh, commented very early on when that was on your slide um, that she was the master of ticket to ride that's a really, really fun <laughs> board game I'm we've so <laughs> <laughs> we've had a, a, a few times here in the on sale office where we've we've played ticket to ride so it's a yeah. good one the other thing that I find that's really nice when you're building games for public programs is if you take an existing uh, either story or game that people would recognize, then it's easier to get people into it. So it's much easier to be like, oh, this is sort of like where in the world is Carmen San Diego, but for teenagers in Asia. And uh, this is, you know, just like Ticket to Ride, but it talks about traveling to the Ozarks, you know, or this is just like Clue, but it happens in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, that really helps you explain it to people rather than starting from scratch and saying like, this is a totally new thing that we created that nobody's ever seen before. So never be afraid to sort of use the existing knowledge base that your players will have from other games. Great. Um, answering another couple of quick questions here. Yes, Ebony, um, if you want to start planning a game, um, contact us here at OnSell. Um, if you have the contact information for your, um, you know, assigned rep, 
definitely reach out to them and we can point you, point you in the right direction and give you the tools and the information that you need to get started. And as Kelly and man mentioned, um, you know, I think a lot of the initial planning happens outside of the on sale builder. It's identifying your goals, looking at what resources you have, you know, where are you, you know, what are you restricted to in terms of, you know, implementation and then kind of coming up with a strategy and then we can help guide you through that by letting you know um, what tools you have available in your on sale plan to, um, to execute that. So definitely contact us and we'll help you get started. Yep. Yep. And likewise, I love brainstorming games. So, you know, feel free to shoot me an email if you're looking for ideas or trying to figure out what to do with your existing resources. Great. Um, I know there were a couple of other ideas we didn't get to bounce around. Um, Mark, Mark DeCracker has a great app um, here in upstate New York uh, that encourages folks to get out on um, get outside and get hiking and, and move their body and it's a passport trail app and you actually earn a badge every time you go out onto a trail so oh, that's um, great. yeah he's looking for some some ways too to help people kind of identify you know the trees and um, you know the flora and stuff that they'll they'll come into contact with out on the trails um, so that's yeah. kind of another nice way to um, create kind of more of an educational game experience. So once you achieve the goal of getting them out there, you could kind of right. make it a little bit more interactive and look at what you want to teach them. One thing that I found for outdoor games um, is that like the the exist the existence of a dichotomous chart. You know, have you heard about dichotomous chart before, where you can um, they'll ask you, you know, is this uh, uh, is the leaf round? Is it long? And you can be like, it's long. You know, is it tall or is it short? It's short. You know, does it have edges or does it is it have um, or is it rounded? Um, and you can answer a bunch of these different questions in order to find out what plant it is that you're looking at. Um, and actually, that has a really good branching game structure, right? Just, you know, yes, no, yes, no, and, and sort of narrows you down to a very specific answer, which is exciting for people that they can just look closely at a plant and answer a bunch of questions and find out what it is. Um, yeah, so, so for outdoor ex exploration, I've used dichotomous charts for a lot of different things. Cool. Um, Carolyn had a great, um, a great goal idea too. So what they're looking to do is to have visitors, um, specifically families with children, stay longer than 15 minutes and hike a trail away from the falls, then share those photos on social media. So uh, yeah, again, with kind of, you know, having people interact with social media and also spend more time engaging with, you know, with their site. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a situation where, you know, if you have some sort of a target at the end of a pathway, then people are more likely to engage, um, you know. And also, the other thing that I find, especially with young families, is that the thing they panic most about is that they just don't know how long it's going to take or what will happen, you know, if they're somewhere too far away from a bathroom, you know, right. or if their kid has a meltdown in the middle of the pathway. What do we do? Um, yeah, so if there's some sort of a cool time target at the end of this pathway, you know, at the end of this uh, um, hiking trail, you know, uh, hike the such and such trail in order to, you know, meet such a digital character or, you know, take a picture with such and such or find the treasure that's in such and such a place, but also give people um, sort of uh, sign off locations as, as they're on their way, you know, so they feel like there's some sort of progression, you know, like you hit checkpoint one, you know, three more checkpoints to go, you uh, you only have 30 more minutes until you reach the treasure, you know, I find with uh, especially with families, uh, with young children, that sort of breadcrumb trail uh, approach makes them feel much more comfortable. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, we're almost 15 minutes past our 30 minute mark. Um, I don't know if I see any new questions. If anybody has um, any last questions that we didn't get to, I know a couple of them were just things like, you know, will this webinar be available and stuff. And our team is answering those in the chat as well. But um, we'll give one last minute for any final questions. Otherwise, um, this will be available. Keep an eye out on our YouTube site. We'll post it there. Um, Monica shared the link. Um, so when that's available, you'll get to rewatch it. Um, share it with your colleagues. And certainly if you have any questions, want to bounce around ideas, uh, feel free to reach out to us here at OnCell. Um, Kellyan is up here, knock knock, at greendoorlabs.com. Um, she's a great resource and we love to collaborate too. So. Um, Hopefully you guys come up with some great ideas that we can launch and um, your visitors can just really take advantage of these cool experiences on site. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, me too. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And uh, we'll, we'll be back soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Allison. See you soon. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.